So uh, thank you for joining us for A Forgotten Chapter Remembered, the British era in Central Florida um, with Dr. Deborah Bauer. I'm Katie Kelly. I'm the Special Programs Coordinator at the Orange County Regional History Center. And if you've never visited us before, we're located in downtown Orlando. We're right next to the um, Orange County Public Library downtown. Uh, our museum is located in the historic 1927 courthouse and houses four floors of exhibits covering Central Florida, Florida's history from 12,000 years ago up to today. Today's program is made possible in part by the Historical Society of Central Florida. Now more than ever, the public support of our historical society is vital to our ability to offer programs like these. I would encourage anyone interested in supporting what we do to check out our website at thehistorycenter.org. Just like every other um, museum across the country, we've been greatly impacted um, by the effects of the pandemic and um, the, the resulting loss of revenue um, due to that. So if um, you're interested in supporting our mission and supporting what we do, please check out our website, thehistorycenter.org, where you can find information about memberships and donations. Today's presentation is being facilitated as a webinar, so that means that participants will not have access to their video or audio for the program, but we will save some time at the end of the program for questions. So if you have those, please feel free to put those in the chat um, at any point during the presentation as they occur to you. Um, I will be monitoring that chat and I will pull questions out for Dr. Bar um, Bauer to address at the end. Today's program is the third installment of our Joseph L. Bruckner series for this year. Um, the series theme for this spring is Becoming Florida as 2021 marks the bicentennial of Florida becoming a U.S. territory. Our Becoming Florida series will include a total of six speaker engagements, each of which will highlight some of the various peoples and cultures who have shaped Florida's early history up to and including its territorial period. The next installment will be held on April 18th at 2 p.m. and we'll welcome Dr. Andrew Frank from Florida State University to lead an exploration of the history and culture of, Florida, of the Florida Seminoles and how they have remained remarkably connected to their roots while also innovating in dramatic fashion. Uh, check out our events page to register for that program and all of the other great programming that we offer. Um, now I'm proud to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Deborah Bauer holds a doctorate from the University of South Florida and a master's and master's degrees from the University of North Florida and University of Central Florida. Her work has appeared in publications including the Florida Historical Quarterly, Florida Studies, and Southeastern Archaeology, and she's currently preparing a manuscript for publication based on her dissertation titled Trial and Error, Royal Authority and Families in the Colonization of British Florida, 1763 to 1784. Dr. Bauer serves on the board of the, uh, uh, excuse me, Dr. Bauer serves on the board of directors of the Seminole County Historical Society and is president of the Society for Historic Castleberry and the Central Florida Anthropological Society. So again, without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Bauer. Um, we, we might not be able to see her, but we'll be able to hear her and see her presentation. Um, and if you have any questions for her as we go, just please remember you can put those in the chat at any point and I'll be pulling those out. So Dr. Bauer, you can go ahead and take it away. If you okay. want to um, start the presentation mode, um, what we see right now is the um, uh, just the, the basic PowerPoint development mode. So if you want to hit the, the slideshow. Yeah, it should be on. Is, are you not seeing it as on? Oh, yeah, no, it's probably, um, that's fine. We, we can see your presentation. It's probably in presenter mode, which, which creates a dual screen, but that's fine. Go ahead with what you have. Okay. Um, I want to thank everyone for having me, particularly the Orange County Regional History Center and also the Museum of uh, Seminole County History helped facilitate me learning about and being invited to join you all for the Bruckner series today. And the title of the presentation, I think, really goes to the heart of one of the things that I love talking about when I talk about British Florida in that it is a very brief, I can't, I can't lie, it is a very, very brief history uh, from a perspective of only having been around for about 21 years in the chronology of, of Florida's larger colonial and territorial past. But it's one of the most important when you're looking at 
things that came to Florida that would shape its identity as both an American territory and as a state in the honor of our um, bicentennial for 1821, um, what we see is things that were introduced in that brief 21 year period. Unfortunately, one of the saddest being the importation of African slaves for use as plantation labor. Um, that comes from the British period. And so one of the things that I'm gonna be sharing with you all today are a little bit of an overview for those of you who are unfamiliar with what the British period in Florida was, and then specifically bringing us to what Central Florida's connection to the British period was. And so um, that's where this title kind of comes from, a forgotten chapter remembered, in that um, for both the positives and the negatives, we as historians always want to try and bring things back into the narrative. And that's what I hope to accomplish today. So I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. And hopefully um, I'm working on getting my camera up as, as I'm speaking. So if you suddenly see it pop up as we go through this PowerPoint, um, that's the technical gremlins. And I, again, I apologize for our late delay on this. So really the story of British Florida starts in 1754. And to make a very long and bloody story short, as is often the case in, in American history, really the history of the whole human experience, uh, things came to be because of a war. And in this particular instance, uh, some of you, if you've ever studied the colonial period, may be familiar with what in the colonies and in America tends to be known as the French and Indian War, what was known in Europe at the time as the Seven Years War. And this was at the time seen as nothing special. It was yet another exchange of warfare between the colonies of Great Britain, or excuse me, between the kingdoms of Great Britain and her allies and France and her allies that had literally been fighting with each other for hundreds of years, going back all the way into the Middle Ages. And so when the war broke out in 1754, no one really expected it to be any different from the dozens of conflicts that had occurred prior to this in a similar manner. The French and their largely Native American allies were on one side, the American colonies were the battleground, and the British military was with a, also with some of their Native American allies, but lesser than the French, uh, went to war. And it lasted for seven years. And at the end of the day, what occurred is we see a treaty of peace was signed in 1763 in the city of Paris. And out of that peace treaty, East and West Florida were ceded, even though the Spanish were not really involved in this conflict as open hostilities uh, or as allies to either side, um, the French decided when they went to the bargaining table because they ended up being the ones on the losing side for this particular conflict, uh, Great Britain, as the victor, was able to demand terms, and the terms they demanded were they wanted France out of North America. They wanted France to cede all of their territories so that they no longer had a substantial presence with the exception of a few fishing islands off the coast of, of Canada. They wanted France out. And France, because they wanted to try and both a abide by the terms of their agreement with the British, but also trying to make sure that the British didn't get exactly what they wanted in the way they wanted, realized that the Spanish were still on the board as chess players in this particular game. And so what they ended up doing is they made it, the French made a deal with the Spanish and the French said, we're going to give you all of this territory of what is now Louisiana. And in return, all you have to do is make sure that our peace treaty with the British is upheld. And when the British find out about this, obviously they're not happy because they thought they were gonna get everything from Canada to Louisiana. And when we say Louisiana in the context of the colonial period, we don't just mean the modern state of Louisiana. If you're thinking of the boundaries in what are the modern state today. At that time, Louisiana actually encompassed pretty much everything that is the Midwestern United States today going up into lower Canada, all the way to the Rocky Mountains. And so it's almost a third of what is the modern day United States, plus a, a chunk of Southern Canada. And the Spanish were all too happy to take this territory off the hands of the French, but to appease the British, the 
Spanish had to give the Brits something. And so when the Spanish went to the Brits and said, what is it going to take to, to make this work? The Brits, not happy about it, said, well, fine, you can keep Louisiana, but we want Florida from you. And so Florida was ceded by the Spanish to the British in a minor treaty that's a part of the larger piece of Paris called the Treaty of Fontainebleau. And not long after, the British crown puts out this piece of uh, very brief uh, legislation called Proclamation of 1763. And while this is in some ways more famously known because it creates a boundary line by which American colonists were not supposed to settle west of the Appalachian Mountains, it also goes ahead and it creates the new 14th and 15th colonies of the British Empire in North America, 14 being East Florida with its capital at St. Augustine and 15 being West Florida with its uh, capital at Pensacola. And so you can see here, um, for our purposes, we're going to be focusing on East Florida today, but you can get a sense of how large and, and expansive this territorial grant from the Spanish to the British was, because West Florida is not just the panhandle. Sometimes people think when, again, you say West Florida in the modern context, what is it? They think it's West Florida of the panhandle to Pensacola. It's not. It actually encompasses significant portions of lower Mississippi, Alabama, and really chunks of uh, upper Louisiana going into the Mississippi River Valley. This is, of course, the person who is in charge of having come up with this brilliant plan with his ministers, King George III of England. And yes, he is the same one that went crazy because he has lost the American colonies a little bit later on during the American Revolution. But I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. So the thing to take away from King George here, aside from the fact that he and his ministers passed this proclamation, is he's going to appoint a Scotsman, a Scots army officer, by the name of General James Grant to become the first general of East, or excuse me, the first governor of East Florida. And Grant is going to be very important to us for a number of different reasons, as we'll see as the story continues. But just to give you a little bit of background on him, he is a younger son of the Laird of Ballandock, which was a uh, Spanish, I don't want to say minor, but it was one of the smaller lairdships in Scotland. And his family, he had several older brothers at the time he was born. He was never in, expected to inherit his brother's lordships. And so he did what many younger sons at the time decided to pursue when they realized they weren't going to inherit the family title and lands, and he went into the military. And Grant was a pretty successful uh, individual when it came to British military tactics. And more importantly, for the story of, of East Florida, he was known to be very uh, jovial, very charismatic. He uh, was often known to throw great parties and his liquor bill, when you see, because he was a very astute record keeper, when you would see his receipts for, for liquor, um, you could tell the man used social libations to grease the wheel of, of bureaucracy wherever he went, because this man, uh, he liked his wine, he liked his port, and he liked his Madeira. And he was known to have the best cook wherever he went. So people were always eager to speak to him, eager to sit down, eager to come and work with him if they were so invited. And that's the other characteristic that Grant was really known for in the fact that he was a problem solver. He liked to think outside the box. If you want to use the modern phrase, he was probably one of the original work hard, play hard type of individuals. And he's going to be the individual that brings so many of the founding personalities into East Florida that are going to play a role role in shaping the history as it comes into what is today Central Florida. So you can see here, this is a view, um, I, this is for about 20 years, about 15 to 20 years it was created before the British takeover, so it's at the very tail end of the first Spanish period, and it's an illustration that gives you an idea of what colonial St. Augustine looks like. 
And so in many ways, if any of you are familiar with downtown St. Augustine today, it has a lot of the same characteristics and the fact that the Castillo de San Marcos, the fort, if any of you have been there, that has been in the same place going back to the 1690s. And when the British take over, they quite obviously don't do anything to it, aside from raising a British flag over it and renaming the fort, um, a version, an anglicized version of its name. They just rename it from the castle of uh, St. Mark's, the Castillo de San Marcos, which is what the Spanish had referred to it as, and they call it Fort St. Mark's. The town itself very much stays the same. Uh, it's to the left of the Castillo, based around what is today modern St. George's Street, Charlotte Street, uh, the plaza where the governor's house is, which I'll show an illustration of in just a minute. Really, the only thing that begins to change from the context of the British period at the beginning is they start to build what is going to be known as the British Quarter. And for those of you who are, again, familiar with the um, layout of St. Augustine, this would be if you're on the street that goes down by the water, which I cannot think of the name of at the current moment, but it's the one that goes past what is the modern day uh, cemetery for the National Guard towards the National Guard barracks. That is actually bringing you into what is the British Quarter. Uh, the modern day um, headquarters of the St. Augustine Historical Society is at the really the heart of what is uh, modern uh, British quarter. And the barracks today, the National Guard barracks, were actually a bakery at the time that was built by the British period uh, residents at this time. So that's really where a lot of the uh, geography comes in. I've got a couple of other maps. This is a 1762 map that was made by an English cartographer named uh, Thomas Jeffries. You can see again the star-shaped uh, castles of Fort Marks. A little bit further to the left, the modern day city as we would think of it going towards what is the San Sebastian River and what is noted as Indian Town. That's going um, more towards the outskirts of where the British proper would have been. This is one of my most favorite maps of all time when you're trying to figure out what the British um, looked like, what the, what the city would have looked like under the British. And the reason is because it is uh, based on a map by a man named John de Solis, and then it's going to be copied several times over by different British cartographers. There's actually a quite beautiful version of it in the public records office at Kew in Great Britain, uh, just outside of London, that's actually colorized. I have copies of that, but I went with this one because you can see the resolution a little bit better. But if you see the star down in the up bottom right-hand center is the fort, in the middle where there is a big white circle, that would be where the modern day Bridge of Lions lands, uh, if you're going over to Anastasia Island, and that's labeled parade, guardhouse, church, and also that's where the governor's house is gonna be. And then again, over to the left is where your British settlement is going to exist. Again, just a little bit, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with what the Fort St. Mark's was. It's a star-shaped uh, fort made of coquina block that took the Spanish several decades to complete. It replaced, as I said, it was finished in the 1690s, and it replaced a wooden palisaded fort that had been built during the first colonial period, going back to the uh, establishment of the city under Pe Pedro Menendez de Avias in the 1560s. So the question then becomes, once Great Britain gets these new territories and they've managed now to consolidate their power hold east of the Mississippi River so that they are the only colonial territorial power that is of a substantial presence there. Because basically when the British take over from the Spanish, with the exception of two or three individuals, all of the other Spaniards evacuate. The majority of them end up going to Havana and Cuba. Some of them go to the newly acquired uh, New Orleans in Louisiana. But for the most part, it is an empty territory. 
There are still a few indigenous people running around, but by and large, by the time you get to the 1760s, the Seminole people, as we will think of them during the 19th century, particularly once they've completed the ethnogenesis of the Lower Creek Confederation remnants coming south into Florida, has really it, it's really at its infancy stages. And it's not to a substantial point where you're going to see significant numbers of what we will think of as, as the Seminole tribe existing in the 1760s. Most of the research, particularly the ethnographic research on the origins of the Seminole people, don't even place the term seminal in wide usage until the British period. So this is actually something else we get from the Brits. It's used for the first time as we can see it by a man named John Stewart, who was the British superintendent of Indian affairs at this time. And the first time that it's historically found is in, I want to say, one of his letters from 1765 or 1766. And he makes reference to just really scattered remnants of, of indigenous people in Florida. Many of the pre-contact names that may be familiar to people like the Calusa, the Timucua, the Ais, uh, all of those, the Mayaka, all of those haven't been completely obliterated either by disease or warfare during the Spanish period. But as I said, handfuls of, of those people are left in, in any given time in the British period. And you don't really have a substantial number of what had been former enslaved Africans in, in British Florida at this point. Again, you did have a large substantial population of what had been runaway enslaved individuals that had taken refuge at Fort Mose to the uh, outside remnants of uh, their settlement a few kilometers from the St. Augustine proper. But when the Spanish evacuated, the majority of people that were left lingering at Fort Mose, and to be quite honest, because Fort Mose had been set on fire so many times by the British during invasions between in the 17... 40s and 1750s, there weren't that many left there, but the few that were there also again evacuated the majority of them to Havana. So in many ways, this was a, a blank slate for the British when they were looking at what type of population they would be dealing with aside from those that immigrated at the behest of the British crown. And what they were trying to figure out is what could they use Florida for? Now that they've gotten it control of it for a strategic purpose, they wanted to try and make it a substantial cog in the wheel of the British mercantile empire. And obviously looking for things like gold and silver, as many of the early Spanish conquistadors had found out, you're not going to find that in Florida. You're not going to find things of mineral wealth that would be substantially useful for the British like they had when they conquered the Aztec Empire in Mexico or the Incan Empire in Peru. You're not going to find uh, really anything aside from, from land and trees. As anyone who's ever been in Florida will know, the one thing that we have plenty of are pine trees. And in the 18th century, one of the things that was very crucial for the British is a group of goods that today is collectively referred to as naval stores. And naval stores were, honestly, they could refer to several different types of, of subcategories. But the one thing they all had in common is they came from pine trees. So timber and lumber were really seen as the number one thing that the British could get from East Florida. Because as, a, as is the case today, still plenty of, of pine forests uh, to be had today in Florida, if you know where to look for them. There were even more back in the 18th century. And so very quickly, the British Crown tries to figure out a way to look for um, a plan to get colonists, to get settlers, to get government officials into East Florida so they can start setting up plantations, hopefully to grow some crops, maybe some cash crops, things like indigo, sea cotton, silk, even uh, wine was grapes were, were cultivated in limited number. But the largest thing by far that was exported and is going to be exported from, from East Florida are going to be these naval stores. Things like turpentine, pitch, rosin, tar, things that are going to be crucial in helping the British Navy maintain their reputation as the largest Navy 
in the world at the end of the 18th century. Those sailing ships, those wooden sailing ships needed lumber to be made. And once the ships were made, they need, needed things like pitch and tar and turpentine to make things watertight, waterproof, to help with the sails and to seal and caulk the wood, wooden timbers to make them floatable. And so these were very, very valuable to the British, uh, perhaps right up there along with things like gold and silver, because the Navy was the way that the British maintained their power base in the late 1700s. So going back to Governor Grant, one of the first things he does, because he gets his appointment in 1760, November of 1763 is when he gets his official appointment, and he's told to get to St. Augustine as quickly as possible. And Grant, who never really did things quickly, not because he was lazy by any means, because I would use many words to describe Governor Grant, and lazy was not one of them, um, he takes his time before he's going to leave London. And he makes sure to start sending out invitations and appointment and instructions and also gathers a tremendous amount of trade goods to take with him. And the reason why he did this was because one of the other sets of instructions that he was going to take back with him was to make peace with the indigenous people that lived in Florida, no matter how scant in number they might have been. Grant was shrewd enough because he had been in the colonies in other parts during the French and Indian War. He realized that he needed to have peace with his indigenous neighbors. And so he wanted to make sure before he departed London that he had things that were trade goods, blankets, woven textiles, beads, weapons, and alcohol, finished alcohol, particularly rum, so that he could go and order John Stewart, that superintendent for Indian affairs, to make a call for a Congress with any native tribe that lived in the vicinity of St. Augustine that wanted to attend. And they chose a spot at what was known as Piccolata, and they hold this, what's going to be known as the first Indian Congress is what the British refer to it as, in late 1765. And Really, this is where the story of the British coming into Central Florida begins, because it's at this Congress, and it's attended very well um, by a number of different Lower Creek chieftains that sent some of the tribes from as far away as Upper Georgia sent representatives to meet with Grant and Stewart outside of St. Augustine. And gifts are going to be exchanged, and terms of a peace treaty are going to be agreed to at this 1765 uh, peace treaty, which it's going to be created out of this meeting. It's going to be known as the Treaty of, of Piccolata. And at it, the British agree to limit settlement by white European colonists to lands in Florida east of the Mississippi River, or excuse me, the St. John's River and its tributaries. All lands west of the St. John's River were seen as Indian held lands and would not be open to settlement. So that brings us to, you can see on this map, um, and this is one of the better, it's not a contemporary map, but you can start to get a, a feeling that there's a lot of writing on this map. And I say that not to be um, ironic or funny, but the reason why I point out there's a lot of writing on this map is because it's based on a map that was done by a surveyor, who I'll speak about in just a minute. But you can see with all of the writing, that means that a lot of different features, geographic features are included on this map. And to find out those features, someone had to actually go in and start surveying. And the first surveyor who's going to be sent after this Congress to do this job is probably, aside from Grant, the second most important man in bringing the British to Central Florida. And it's actually a German by the name of William de Brom, who's going to be sent out. He's actually a, a pretty prestigious man by this point. He's German by birth. He was born, born in, uh, at the time, what was known as the city of Koblenz from the Holy Roman Empire. And he ends up uh, making his way because he had studied cartography and map making and was very, very good at what he did. He ends up being invited to South Carolina in the 1750s. 
And because at this particular time, there were not a lot of people that were both skilled cartographers and were willing to go into what was really seen as the wilds of the British colonial backcountry, um, people like de Brom were, were treated almost like a, a type of royalty because they were the key to having settlers, finding out what type of land was available for cultivation and settlement, finding out where boundaries were, where natural features like uh, water, rivers, swamps, any type of geographical, cartographic type of, of feature that you would want to know about, de Brom was the type of person who would go out and find out. And as I said, he was very, very good at his job. And unfortunately, probably because he was out doing his job so well, we don't actually have, despite how famous and how important he's going to be to the story of, of the British coming to Central Florida, we don't have an image of him. But what I did put up here is what is probably his most famous work, which is uh, something called the Atlantic Pilot, which is, I don't want to go off on too far a tangent, but I'll simply say if any of you guys are geographic nuts, if you like looking at maps or want to know the nature of cartography in the late 18th century, the Atlantic Pilot is a really good place to start. And so de Brom ends up getting, uh, he goes to South Carolina, does his work there for, for a few years. Then he's uh, invited to Savannah, and he actually uh, has his wife, his first wife, Wilhelmina, with him. They have two children while they're in Savannah. They have a son and a daughter. The daughter is named Wilhelmina after her mother. And I, the son's name, I cannot think of at the current moment off the top of my head. I think he was another William after his father, but I would not quote me on that minute detail. But the children are going to be important to our story because um, his wife ends up dying. And the records are a little bit scanty, but we know that she dies while he's in Savannah. And we know that their children are quite young. They're like you know, six and four, seven and five, something like this. And so de Brom, who is very upset because he had been married for a number of years, the records seem to indicate that he and Wilhelmina had married in Germany before he immigrated to the colonies. He brought his wife with him. And so he's in this depression, sitting in Savannah, and he has these two young children, and he's like, I need to figure out a way to care for my family. And so Governor Grant, who, like I said, that guy had grapevines planted all over the place where he would listen for gossip and chatter, realizes that if he can get the surveyor, like de Brom, down to East Florida, and to give him a reason to make his base in St. Augustine, that it will be a way to ensure that territories further south in what is today now Central Florida, will get surveyed. So he invites him to St. Augustine, is going to give him lots of different honors, titles, land, a house in the city. But more importantly, he very quickly arranges a match with an 18-year-old woman who, despite my best efforts for going on almost 15 years, I have not been able to find her first name. I only know her family name, which was Roe, R-O-W-E. And she had a little bit of a scandalous past herself. Um, to sum up a very long and interesting and, and salacious story, um, before de Brom came to St. Augustine, she had fallen in love with the surgeon attached to the uh, British fort, Fort St. Mark's, uh, Robert Catherwood. And Catherwood apparently was using Miss Rowe to keep him company. And I put company in quotation marks, if everyone can take what I truly mean by that, um, with promises that he would marry her in time. And in the immediacy, they continued to socialize, again, with quotation marks around the word socialize. Word of the affair gets out. Her father challenges the doctor to a duel. The doctor ends up showing up at the duel drunk, ends up being uh, hurt slightly by a misfire of her father. But in the bottom line, what ends up happening is this girl's reputation is going to be ruined unless they can find out a way to get her quickly married. Catherwood refused to marry her. And so Governor Grant, ever the shrewd opportunist, because at this particular point, 
Debrom was quite older than than Miss Roche. He was in his fifties, and Grant thought that maybe Debrom wouldn't be too picky about the type of woman if she was young enough, if she was pretty enough, if she was in need of a white knight to save her. And also, also he had children that needed looking after. So he puts this uh, into motion very quickly uh, by inviting Debrom to St. Augustine. Roe, Miss Roe and her family are also invited to the governor's table. And it's at this building that you see here. Uh, this is a painting that was done of governor's house, which is where he would have lived when he lived in St. Augustine. It is not a British building, although Grant did make some uh, architectural alterations to the building, but by and large, it is the same one that exists in downtown St. Augustine today. If any of you ever get the chance, on the bottom floor, there's a wonderful museum that I strongly encourage you to check out. It's about the city and history of St. Augustine, um, really one of the fabulous, more fabulous ones in a city of museums. And so Debrom and Miss Rowe end up meeting each other. He pursues her and they eventually get married. So Governor Grant's goal to get the surveyor to stay in East Florida is successful. And he goes out and very quickly begins to survey different lands. Now, what you can see here is I have a map of what would be um, North Eastern Seminole County and then if you all see where Lake Monroe would be, that would be where Sanford proper is. To the east of that would be going down State Road 46, going out towards Chuliova, Chuliota, Geneva, and Oviedo. South of it would bring you into uh, modern day Longwood, Altamont Springs, Castleberry, and then further west would be what is modern day Orange County, places like Apopka uh, going towards downtown. So when you see the names here, Lake George has pretty much stayed the same, but in the British time, all of the other bodies of water had different names. So for example, in the British period, Lake Monroe was not named, known as Lake Monroe. De Brom actually names it after Governor Grant. And so it was called Lake Grant. Lake Jessup would have been a different name. Lake Harney was known as Upper Lake. Um, I will think of what Lake Jessup was. It slipped my mind at the current moment. But what you can see here is now we've entered Central Florida proper. And you can see this map is courtesy of uh, Florida History Online website where um, Professor of History Emeritus Daniel L. Schaefer has done over the last 15 years a tremendous amount of work in trying to make plantation records available from the British period. Um, and what you see here, this is a creation from, from one of his maps. You can see here that there are little houses and there are little trees. And wherever you see a house, that means that a grant of land was made by the British government to a settler who applied for land because they said they wanted to build a plantation house on it. It does not necessarily mean that a plantation house was built. When you see uh, indications of the little trees, that means again, a plot of land had been uh, applied for and those plots of land were applied for not necessarily because the owner wanted to build a plantation and live there, but he knew that that was a richly timber forested area. And so there were these grants by private citizens wanting to hire crews to go in and get timber for the creation of these naval stores. And so really that's one of the first main reasons why the British come in to what is today Central Florida, because we see that the timber is just too dense, it's too rich, it's too natural a, tempt a temptation for British uh, settlers and, and absentee landlords wanting to try and make a profit. And so they want to try and begin some type of industry in the Central Florida area. What I've included here is a quote from one of the first people that was not DeBron or one of his helpers 
DeBrom, while he was named chief surveyor of actually the entire Southern District of, of the British colonies, um, in addition to being chief surveyor for East Florida, he had a number of different assistants. Dr. William Stork would have been one. His son-in-law, uh, Captain George Frederick Mulcaster, would have been a second one. His son, uh, who is the, the brother of the infamous Roe, is, is basically his brother-in-law uh, of the woman that he married, ends up becoming one of his assistants. But I really like this quote from William Bartram because what we see here is, and again, it's kind of hard to pinpoint because William Bartram went on two trips. He went through one with his father from 1764 to 1765, all the way through East and West Florida. And then he came again as an adult from 1774 to about 1775, where as a naturalist, he traveled observing the land, the plants, the animals, the environment. And this is a quote as best we can figure out, he camped somewhere near Lake George. And this would have been what I personally think, although for, for the one opinion I'm about to give you, you will find many other historians who will argue it was in a different place. I think that this was south of Lake George where Bartram writes this description. So it means we're coming into what is uh, the southeastern edge, or I'm sorry, the southwestern edge of Volusia, modern day Volusia County and going towards Seminole County. Um, I think this is on the southern frontier of Lake George going towards Lake Monroe. Um, but as I said, that's just me based on my own personal readings. I think it does a good example though for you if you're trying to get an idea of what things would have looked like if you want a description, a first-hand account of what the land was like. I, I don't think the difference of 20 or 30 or 40 miles is going to be all that far different. So this kind of sets a scene for us in which you get an idea of what the world at this point was before you started to have industry come in under the British. Now, I love including this map because it gives you an idea of just how badly if you had a cartographer who was not as good as he, at his job as, as de Brom was, how much they can screw things up. And this was done by a Spaniard named Pedro Diaz and it was dated 1769. So this is six years later than any of the uh, British you know, de has been on the ground now for, for a long time in Florida, and he's making maps left and right, but the Spanish were also interested in making maps. And so this particular um, map from what you see here, if you see on the upper right hand side, you see the word mosquitoes, that refers to Mosquito Inlet. If any of you are familiar, what is um, uh, Brevard County, modern day Brevard County, a little bit further south, uh, Canaveral is labeled there. That would be modern day Cape Canaveral. And then you've got these two blobs that are in the middle. Um, you can see the larger one is, believe it or not, supposed to be Lake George. The one under it is supposed to be Lake Monroe. And the one to the right is supposed to be the St. John's River as it feeds into Lake Harney. You can obviously see this was not an individual, uh, Mr. Diaz, no offense to him, but you can see how badly his scale was off. You can see how close, you know, according to this map, if you're paying attention, uh, Lake George and Lake Monroe are probably 10 miles apart from one another, which obviously we know they're not. Um, but the other interesting thing to note is right in the upper center part, there's a handwritten script that's labeled Mayako. And Mayako actually is an indication of what they believed to be indigenous tribes that were still present. The Mayaka were a sub, a very distinctly related, distantly related to the Timakwas uh, from, if any of you are familiar with the uh, native tribes that would have been up in, up towards Jacksonville. Um, again, although it's listed on here as this being an area that's from the Mayacas. The Mayacas are pretty much gone, but the Spanish, because they're working on outdated information, are still assuming that they're there. And so this is an example of a very bad map. This is an example of a modern reinterpretation of a very, very good map. 
And this is another map that I have borrowed from Florida History Online from Dr. Schaefer's excellent work. And what you see here is Lake Grant, which would be again Lake Monroe, and the upper lake, which is Lake Harney, which gives you an idea of the fact that you actually had land grants, the very first settlers that came to the Oviedo, Geneva, Black Hammock, Chuliota areas, in addition to Samford, would have been in the British period. We actually have names attached to these. Um, there is, I need to be fair to indicate that these particular individuals, although they own the land, they claimed it, it was surveyed. This map was, uh, the modern map was recreated because the one that was done by de Brom actually, although it exists in the British Records Office in London, it uh, underwent a very terrible flood at some point in the late 1800s. And so the map itself was very poor poor condition. And Dr. Schaefer and his students were able to examine it enough to get uh, data to be able to recreate it here, which is why I've shown the recreation, because I think it's more clear. But um, you can see here that de Brahm's map was just, honestly, he's, it shows you how good he was. And so this is uh, the very first uh, landowners, I would argue, the very first traceable landowners for Central Florida during the colonial period. Most people go back to the Moses Levy land grant of the second Spanish period. You can see these British grants to people like Alexander Grant, John Beresford, John Jervis, Ricketts, Samuel Barrington. They predate Moses Levy's land grant by almost 50 years. This is uh, another, just to give you an idea of a description of someone who was actually here during the time. William Stork was, as I mentioned, he's a doctor, but worked as an assistant to Governor, uh, excuse me, not Governor, to William de Brom. Sometimes de Brom thought he was governor, but that's a story for another time. Um, dated 1768, and you can get an idea um, because he was actually on the ground in Semin what is today Seminole County. So. Um, by virtue of that, uh, for those of you who may not know a fun fact, Seminole and Orange County actually were the same county up until 1913. They were united. So this is actually uh, Central Florida as we think of it. Seminole County, uh, what was one time Orange County, they, they were here. And again, you get a description from Stork to Beresford, who was the Earl of Tyrone, talking about what land was like. Now, what is the goal? The goal is for these people to start bringing in labor so that they can start producing uh, lumber and timber, going after the timber so that naval stores can be created. And records up until this point start to get a little dicey in the British period because at the same time Great Britain is settling British Florida and East Florida, they're also dealing with what is the known as in a larger chronological timescape as the age of the imperial crisis in the original 13 colonies. So at the same time, East Florida is being settled. You have all of these things going down South. You also have things like the Sons of Liberty. You have things like the Boston Massacre occurring in January of 1770. You eventually are going to have war breakout between the Patriots and the American Patriot colonists and the British Redcoats at the Battle of Lexington and Concord, the two battles in April of 1775. And so quite literally, the American Revolution is happening on this same track. And it is going to cause difficulty for our records in East Florida. But we do know that there were some attempts to, and what, I, what my hypothesis is, is we do know that the last most Southern actual settled plantation house would have been on the southern boundaries of Lake George. And it was uh, known as Beresford's Plantation. We had enslaved African labor that was brought into uh, British Florida. The British are actually, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, unfortunately, the first group of colonial people who use enslaved African labor for any large widespread plantation settlement as we will think of it during the antebellum period. So that unfortunately is a negative that they, pretty substantial negative that they're going to introduce to Florida during this time period that's going to be replicated and copied both during the second Spanish period and then during American territorial. Um, the legacy of, of using enslaved labor comes 
as I said, from the British. But for the purposes of industry, I do think that it was not unremarkable to think that there may have been some attempts to use some of the labor at Beresford's plantation to come down the river to begin cutting trees, bringing the timber industry into uh, those land grants that you saw on the previous slide. Now you can see here, this is a little bit later map, it's 1794, but it doesn't change all that much. You can still see again, a pretty good indication, Lake George is in the center, or excuse me, the upper top, in the center would be Lake Monroe, Lake Harney would be down towards the bottom. And I think that that's where you did start to see some, some preliminary industry in the late 1770s going to 1780. There is a lot of difficulty documenting this though, because it was a time of war. The other reason I think you also are going to start to see uh, industry in Central Florida during the British period during this time is prior to 1775, the British had only had a total of about 3,000 both white Native American enslaved African population throughout East Florida. We know, although the British never conducted an official census based on some other demographic studies, that refugees, loyalist refugees, people who didn't support the British um, being kicked out of the American colonies as, as they wanted to stay loyal to King George, they're going to flood into East Florida between 1775 and 1782 as refugees. And the population swells from 3,000 people to over 20,000. And so there just wasn't enough land unless they started pushing further south for some of these settlers to come and start making a living for themselves. Unfortunately for us, many of them were doing so without legal title to the land, because obviously de Braun is long gone by this point. Uh, Mulcaster is still, his son-in-law, George Mulcaster, is, is still there working as a surveyor, but by and large, everything is going to try and keep things stable for the war period. And so until, this is where archaeology, this is sometimes where I turn to archaeology for help, until we start to get an idea of where there might be some remnants of things left, we won't be able to tell for sure who was when, where and how doing what during the later part of the American Revolution in, in Central Florida. Um, unfortunately for the British and the people living here in East Florida, um, the Americans win the war, the British lose, and just as the French had been made to give their territory over to the British and, and the Spanish in 1763, the British have to return Spain to Spain, East Florida, at the end of the American Revolution. So that's how Britain loses its East Florida territory in 1783. They have 18 months to evacuate, and unlike the Spanish, who a generation earlier had pretty much emptied out the territory, some Britons do decide to stay beyond and, and live in this colony under Spanish dominion between 1784 and 1821. But that is another story for another time. I'm not gonna go too far afield. What I will simply say is <coughs> there is a lot of interesting things when you look at the British period, things that are going to be built upon and not really changed by the Spanish in the second Spanish period and subsequently American territorial that actually were rooted in the British period. And so um, with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone, uh, particularly again, to give my gratitude to the Orange County Regional History Center, the Museum of Seminole County History. And for those of you who have not ever had a chance to check it out, please go and visit Florida History Online at the University of North Florida. It's a wonderful research resource, uh, particularly if you're a historian interested in just finding out more about the period, or if any of you might be teachers, there's some great resources for public school teachers there too. So that having been said, um, I'm now going to, uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions, not very much, but I am going to. Um... Yeah, we got a couple questions. Can you guys, yeah. can you hear me, Dr. Bauer? Yes, I can. Okay, and if the um, I think I was having some audio issues earlier, so if someone in the of the attendees can just type yes in the chat, so I know that you all can hear me as well. I'm assuming you can, if Dr. Bauer can. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so yeah, so um, 
I'm just going to start with the first question we got. Uh, so what was the personal impression of the British of Florida? Did they think it was promising or profitable? Um, or did they think it was a mistake to try and colonize? You know, that's a great question. And that's one that it depended on who you asked. Um, if you were talking to men of uh, who like Governor Grant, who believed in the lawn game. He knew that Florida was not going to be made into a paradise in even one, two or three generations, but he and a very limited number of, of people who tended to be a part of the aristocracy, you can think of them as the money men. They wanted to invest and they saw East and West Florida as investments and they thought it was great. They were almost in a way a generation ahead of themselves because they tended to be thinking more along the lines of people um, who would become famous plantation owners during the 1830s, 1840s and 1850s. When we had those really uh, traditional, uh, if you think cotton plantations in Florida or sugar plantations, those are the things that people like Governor Grant envisioned and he was just too early in the chronology to be able to see it come to fruition. If you asked, however, the majority of people who came here either by choice or perhaps as an indentured servant or as um, a white settler coming to get land, many of them thought Florida was horrible. And I think if you think of the fact, if any of you have ever been outside Florida, just Imagine being in Florida the last couple of days that we've had the 95 degree heat, the high humidity in an era when we did not have air conditioner, we did not have bug spray. They thought it was horrible. The death rates were incredibly high because people didn't realize you could get sick from things like mosquitoes and so much of Florida is swamp. You tie that and throw it into that in the British period, you had just as active a colonial uh, hurricane season as you did today and they thought it stunk to high heaven and most people who once they came to florida if they didn't die within a year or two of being here from disease they ended up leaving as fast as they could be so your everyday common average joe was like get me out of here yeah i can understand that um so uh, someone's curious, how did Grant communicate with the indigenous people and uh, to get them to come to the Congress, particularly the ones that came from North Georgia? Okay, so what he, this, this really goes back to the work of John Stewart. So John Stewart, although his name was uh, superintendent of Indian affairs, that was a really fancy way for saying guy who goes, travels from Indian village to Indian village and talks to people. And so quite literally, Stewart and his staff would show up in the capitals only when they had to. Otherwise, these guys were on the ground. They were going from place to place. And his staff wasn't substantially large, but it was large enough that um, they, they had built relationships through trade, through upper uh, trading stores. In East Florida, the main trading store would have been at a place called... Um, Spalding's Upper uh, Upper Creek, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. Spalding's, no, Spalding's Lower Store. And the Indians wanted in, in Florida, wanted to trade with the European settlers. So once word was given, and basically Grant would have sent word out probably not long after he got to East Florida in the fall of 1864. I think that tells you why it took until November of the following year, because word went out to these people. Stewart personally took it to a lot of places, and then it would have um, gotten through the grapevine, because you would have seen tribes sending out word and messengers from there. Um, so uh, we, it looks like we have several attendees from a group of um, uh, living history um, reenactors called the East Florida Rangers. And someone said, um, there's no mention of, so, so they said this seems like an early um, history. There's no mention of Thomas Brown and his contributions or John Hewitt in the water driven sawmill. Um, so I think that they're just wondering if you're, uh, if you have anything to comment on those people. Um, most of those people are going, and, and the reason why I didn't speak about them is most of those are going to be concentrated in the St. Augustine proper area, going up north towards Rollstown, going west towards um, St. Mark's, 
Um, really for this particular presentation, since it was geared towards Central Florida, I was talking, I was focusing more on what the southernmost terminus would have been. Um, the rangers would not have come down that far, to be quite honest, because the only thing that you would have had down here, there would have been two plantations, Beresford's plantation on the lake, and then you would have had uh, further towards the coast, there was a plantation called Stobbs Farm that was owned by a man named William Elliott that would have been um, actually in Brevard, what is today Brevard County, um, near basically what is Launchpad 39A over in that area. And so with those, uh, you know, they would have gone down the King's Road, but most of what I've read indicates that they tended to stop uh, particularly once New Smyrna, the New Smyrna settlement of Andrew Turnbull was evacuated in 1773 going to 1775. The Rangers are going to be more concerned with the northern border uh, and the settlements up north of St. Augustine as opposed to south. So that's why I didn't really go into those. Um, are there any distinctly English style architectural remains that exist to the present um, or have any archaeological sites with, it, with such architecture been found? Um, more so in uh, Pensacola than in, in St. Augustine. Um, really the only, and I think I mentioned this in the presentation, but um, in case it slipped my mind, the um, major British contribution that still survives, there are a few houses, wooden houses in the British Quarter down by the St. Augustine Historical Society headquarters. Um, but really the, the major architectural um, legacy, if you will, is the National Guard barracks. That is That was completely built during the British period, designed by the British period. It's the only completely constructed, designed, and still standing building from the British period that exists in St. Augustine. Today. Um, so just so everyone uh, listening is aware, I put up a slide um, with the Bartram quote um, by the request of one of the attendees. So that's why I changed the slide. Um, someone's asking how far did how far south did the boundary of the St. John's River extend marking Indian territory? Okay, so that would be according to the terms in the Treaty of Piccolata. The wording is a little bit vague and nebulous as the British tended to make things on purpose but they refer to the headwaters of the St. John's. And today, of course, we know that the headwater of the St. John's goes much further south than Seminole County, although that's the start of the headwaters. Um, but in the, the Treaty of Piccolata, um, they refer to the headwaters being um, basically modern day Lake Monroe, Lake Harney, and Lake Jessup. And so the southern terminus in the treaty, again, with, with the understanding that it was nebulous so that the British, if they had stayed here longer, probably would have said, oh, we have a right to go further south, would have probably been roughly around where uh, State Road 46 meets I-95. That, that would be the closest modern day boundary that I could give you. Um, someone's wondering if there are similar maps constructed showing the placement of land grants um, closer to St. Augustine than the rest of the colony. Yes, yes, they are. Um, there is an entire, uh, Dr. Schaefer has documented all of the British land grants for um, what is known as the King's Road. The King's Road went from uh, Stobbs Farm in Brevard County, uh, Elliott's Farm in, in uh, Brevard County, all the way up to uh, where it goes into Georgia. Uh, he has spent so much time, so many years putting together this great resource and not a lot of people know about it. So if you're interested in looking at other plantations, ones that go through the entire Kings Road, uh, just Google Florida History Online, University of North Florida, and the link will come up. All right. So um, we're getting... Um close to about quarter after. So I think I'm just gonna make this our last question. Um, do we know how the indigenous people of Central Florida identified Lake Harney and Jessup? Um, do we know their British names before the arrival of, or do, excuse me, do we know their names before the arrival of the British? Um, that is a really difficult question to answer. And here is the reason why. Because, so the, the people that we would think of as predating the Seminoles, were in this particular area would have been primarily an offshoot of the Timucua peoples 
they were known as the Mayaka. The Mayaka would not have considered themselves to Makwas, but if you're looking at, at branches between pottery and, and tools that have been found and the actual language, what little we know of it, there do seem to be some relations, but there were so few of them around the best I would be able to give you is what the Spanish would have referred to them as. And we have no way to know if what the Spanish were calling things. And this stands true, not just for Central Florida, this stands true for anywhere the Spanish empire was dealing with indigenous peoples. The Spanish tended just like all the other Europeans to give things their own name. And so what the uh, actual uh, native indigenous tribes would have called things, we really don't have uh, any records. They didn't leave written records for us. The Mayaka didn't leave written records. Most of what we know comes from archaeological uh, excavations and um, some occasional little reference you will see because the remnants of the Mayaka would have been subsumed into the Seminole peoples. There's a really great book by an archaeologist named Brent Wiseman who's retired from the University of South Florida who wrote a book on the ethnogenesis of the Seminole tribe. And there is some, what he believes is an indication that you would see an occasional couple families here and there would be subsumed into the Seminole, what is now today the Seminole nation from remnants of people like the Mayaka. So you would get occasional words, stories, but again, what was preserved versus what we know of in today's society is very hard because Seminole historians, actual indigenous seminal tribes, um, they tend, I don't want to say they guard their history, but they tend to be very, um, I'm trying to choose the right word here so I don't put my foot in my mouth. They tend to be very protective of things to outsiders outside of the seminal tribe. And so things that the seminal tribe even today may know we may or may not know because they don't necessarily share, and rightly so, because they're protective of their past that's been exploited so often for, for gain by outsiders. We don't know. So the answer to your question is there might be some reference to an oral history somewhere. To my knowledge, there is no written document, though. 